Uh, thank you, Mr. President. The fact of the matter is that the world is facing a climate emergency. We are on track for at least four degrees of warming. We are already seeing tipping points exceeded. We are seeing it with the Antarctic ice sheets, for example, where disintegration is occurring and it's now a matter of when, not if, whether it is decades or longer or hundreds of years, the fact is it is irreversible. We have seen the record Arctic ice melt and now the latest science showing that the wind systems around the Arctic have changed, which will lead to really extreme winters in Europe. We're going to see more excessive flooding in the UK, for example. Here in Australia, we are going to see more extreme weather events. We're going to see the heat waves that lead to catastrophic circumstances for many people and death, death rates going up. We are also going to see more extreme bushfire days. We are not prepared for this. And that is why, under the last period of government, the Greens worked with the Labor Party to deliver a clean energy package to bring down Australia's emissions. And the reason we, we, we implemented an emissions trading scheme was because a market mechanism is the cheapest way to bring down emissions and it can be scaled up. And the reality is Labor and the Greens could not agree on what the cap should be, that is, how fast and how deeply should Australia bring down its emissions. And that is why we set up the Climate Change Authority based on the similar authority in the United Kingdom. And we said, let's set up a professional body which will look at the science, look at what's happening around the world, look at what Australia's appropriate carbon budget should be, and that it would report in early 2014, and then the parliament would move to implement that as a flexible price with the cap. And the cap that the, Carbon, the uh, Climate Change Authority recommended was 40 to 60 per cent by 2030 and to at least implement 19 per cent now. And the default was actually 19 per cent. And yet this government, together with the Palmer United Party, decided to abolish the existing emissions trading scheme which was working to bring down emissions, particularly in the electricity sector. And that is the area where we desperately need to drive change, to get out of coal-fired generation and into renewable energy as quickly as possible. And the Greens are committed to 100 per cent renewable energy as soon as possible. And that is why we celebrate the fact that the renewable energy target and the programs which we had implemented actually were bringing down emissions, rolling out jobs and projects across Australia. It was something and is something to celebrate, and it is why we will not compromise to bring down the renewable energy target to facilitate coal. But not only did we have an emissions trading scheme and a renewable energy target and the Climate Change Authority, but we also had the Clean Energy Finance Corporation and the Australian Renewable Energy Agency. And the Clean Energy Finance Corporation is again driving mega rollout of jobs. And I would be most appreciative if either the Palmer United Party or the government can tell us what the deal has meant for the Clean Energy Finance Corporation and ARENA. Because according to the papers today, the deal makes it actually worse. Far from saving them, according to today's paper, the deal is that you will put off bringing in the abolition bills until December this year. Until December this year. So, therefore, implying that the Palmer United Party and the government are happy for those abolition bills to come back here early next year. How is that saving the Clean Energy Finance Corporation? You have actually just put a huge pall of uncertainty over both those organisations after 
Again, the government and the Palmer United Party got together to take $717 million out of ARENA over the Ford estimates. You have taken away the ability to fund new projects. There is an attack on every good thing that was achieved in terms of bringing down emissions, rolling out jobs, especially investment in rural and regional Australia. But I now come to the Carbon Farming Initiative. We set that up with the Biodiversity Fund. And why? Because the rural sector has been saying to us for years, if you want us to help preserve biodiversity, to deal with feral animals, if you want us to actually do the right thing and steward the land as we'd like to, you need to help us financially. And that is why we set up both the Carbon Farming Initiative and the Biodiversity Fund. And I condemn the fact that the Rudd government destroyed and abolished the Biodiversity Fund. That was disgraceful. It was part of the agreement and they abolished it. But the Carbon Farming Initiative was a way of giving farmers an income for actually making certain that they invest in projects which bring down emissions or secure carbon in the landscape. And that is essential that we do that. Now we are seeing an attack on that as well. We've got a hideously expensive, ineffective direct action plan uh, which uh, the Palmer United Party leader had described as an ineffective policy and a waste of money at a time when families, pensioners, young Australians, stay-at-home mums, single parents and our Indigenous communities are facing unfair measures in the budget. That was, of course, after the leader of the Palmer United Party also said that he wouldn't pass direct action unless the government accepted his emissions trading scheme. And let me just put to bed an idea that anything like the emissions trading scheme which he proposed was actually one when you're having it, um, an emissions trading scheme when you're not actually having one, because it was zero cap and zero price, and not to come into effect until all the trading partners had an emissions trading scheme and we had a global emissions trading scheme. That is never. And just to add to that, India was, of course, added to it just to make sure it would never happen. It was a sham and a shonk from the start, and everybody could see that. But nevertheless, it was the price that he wanted the government to pay to accept the deal. And what a pathetic situation we now have is that the, the deal now is, far from accepting the emissions trading scheme, we've got the Climate Change Authority into having an investigation over the next 18 months, which the government says it will take no notice of. That is where Clive Palmer's deal ended up. So why would the Palmer United Party accept such a rubbish outcome, knowing full well that it is a waste of money? Well, I, this is one thing I mentioned this week in relation to the late Gough Whitlam. He always said that when you don't know where someone's coming from, just back self-interest because it's always trying. That is absolutely the case here when it comes to this policy because it is, we have seen the government and the Palmer United Party tear down a scheme which required the polluter to pay the polluter to pay, and that include Mr Palmer's own companies had to pay the carbon price, and it was a multi-million dollar bill for the Palmer United Party uh, leader. Now we've got a situation where the reverse is occurring. Not only did he tear down the polluter pays, but he is now putting in place the polluter gets paid, gets paid by the taxpayer. What a perfect outcome. The big polluters can now put out their hand for taxpayers' dollars in order to be paid to do something that they should have been doing anyway, probably would have been doing anyway. No requirement on the additionality that makes any sense. They're going to hang back and wait to be paid. As economist uh, Frank Giozzo at the Australian National University Centre for Climate Economics and Policy has said, the proposed emissions reduction fund under the Direct Action Plan amounts to a scheme of project-based subsidies funded by taxpayers. The emissions reduction fund approach could be useful to support particular emission reduction activities 
insofar as the budgetary costs can be justified, but it is not a suitable instrument for a long-term, broad-based climate change mitigation action. The effectiveness and cost-effectiveness of an emissions reduction fund will be limited by fiscal costs and fiscal constraints by private incentives to overstate emissions savings and to hold back investment unless subsidised by the relatively short proposed time horizons for payments, uh, by the instruments being confined to specific eligible activities and by the relatively large administrative burden, it could also encourage continued lobbying by potential beneficiaries. Well, of course it will. That is uh, that's the conclusion of that quote from Fr Professor Frank Yotzo. So we have a situation now with a scheme that can't be scaled up to meet the kind of emission reduction that is required. Let's say it's 60 per cent by 2030, which is where Australia should be aiming. This won't even deliver 5 per cent by 2020. I ask the minister today, where is your modelling? Have you done any to suggest that the direct action deal is going to give us anywhere near 5 per cent? Reputex has said it will give you 20 to 30 per cent of the 5 per cent. Sinclair Knight has said it won't do it, it can't do it. The money isn't enough to go anywhere near it. And also when you look at the budgetary allocation, yes it's 2.5 billion, but what has been allocated over the Fords is 1.15 billion out until 2017-18. This is not going to do anything to bring down emissions. So not only is the government talking through its hat when it says, oh yes, it will, no evidence, no modelling base, not one single economist, not one single scientist. You can't stand up with any legitimacy and suggest this is going to be anything other than just handouts to the big polluters, just like John Howard, the former Prime Minister's scheme, the greenhouse uh, gas abatement scheme was judged to be a complete waste of money. So too will this be. And that's why Malcolm Turnbull was right when he said that it was fiscal irresponsibility on a grand scale. He also described it as the big polluters getting their sticky fingers into taxpayers' pockets. And that's precisely uh, what it is going to do. But I want to go on to the safeguards because this is the uh, the fig leaf that's being, prevent, being proposed, oh, at some point in the future, actually we're pushing it out to 2016, we'll bring in some kind of safeguards measure. But the Prime Minister is hoist on his own petard here. He said, ax the tax, no tax, cannot have a carbon tax. A baseline and credit scheme to work has to have realistic baselines. When the big polluters exceed them, they pay. That is a tax. So we know now the government's got no intention of having any rigour around baselines at all. But I want to come to native forests. This is devastating for campaigners around Australia. We had a prohibition under the Carbon Farming Initiative from being able to get a carbon farming project registered if it involves the harvesting or clearing of a native forest or the use of materials obtained as a result of clearing or harvesting a native forest prohibited. Now, because the native forest logging industry is on its knees, they can't get any money for their wood chips, they have been lobbying hard to be able to keep on logging, get paid to log, to feed native forests into forest furnaces to sell energy. That is going to be the fate of Tasmania's forests, of Victoria's forests, Western Australia, right around the country. They are lining up the idea that you'll get paid by the taxpayer to knock down native forests and feed them into forest furnaces. And that is the deal that Clive Palmer and Tony Abbott, the Prime Minister, have actually lined up here. And it's disgraceful. I am going to be moving an amendment on that uh, during the committee stage. And I would hope that if people do not want to see native forests, knocked down and fed into forest furnaces, then they will support that amendment. But also, just as a final thing, there are several other amendments I intend to, to put through. There has been a disassociation with NRM plans, for example, which is really important to stop uh, the abuse of water, the use of 
another round of MIS schemes, which is entirely possible under this. And of course, there is ridiculous ministerial discretion being provided here in relation to the carbon farming initiative. But I'm also going to be moving a second reading uh, amendment. Uh, at the end of the motion, I will be asking that the Senate notes that if we continue without change, Australia will use its entire 2050 emission, emissions budget within 16 years, and the world will warm by at least four degrees by 2100, destroying Australia's Great Barrier Reef, agricultural industries and creating massive vulnerabilities in public health and national security. And secondly, the Senate is of the opinion that there is no time to waste on an ineffective, expensive, direct action policy that allows unlimited pollution, will hurt our global competitiveness and will give taxpayers money to the biggest polluters with no guarantee of emissions reductions. And that is precisely uh, why we should be voting against direct action. It is a sham of a policy. And when you put it in the global context of where we are now, where the world is starting to move, recognising that we have to address global warming. We've just had the United Nations summit in New York where the Secretary-General Ban Ki-moon invited countries to put more ambitious uh, targets on the table. Not only did our Prime Minister not go, but our Foreign Minister put our lousy 5 per cent target by 2020 on the table. The room was virtually empty. Australia was humiliated. Now we have the G20 coming up. And the G20 leaders are going to arrive in Australia as this parliament will have rammed through the shonkiest deal ever in terms of a hideous waste of taxpayers' money with no cap, no cap whatsoever on the big polluters, all lined up with their hand out for the taxpayers' dollars to get paid out for whatever they can scheme and scam the system for. And the G20 is going to arrive for the meeting just as this news starts to permeate out, especially ahead of the news about logging native forests for forest furnaces. Then we go into the Lima talks and head towards Paris next year. It is a complete joke for the government or the Palmer United Party to argue this is some sort of basis for heading towards Paris. It is nothing of the kind. Australia has to put its post-2020 target on the table in the first half of next year. In fact, has been invited to by the end of March, but no doubt, as laggards, we won't do it. There is no process from this government to talk about what our post-2020 target should be. The European Union has just put 40 per cent on the table, 40 per cent emission reduction by 2030, and that's their opening bid. They know they will have to go up from there, not down, but up from there. And what's Australia's bid? Nothing. Nothing on the table post-2020, and this policy won't guarantee it. Mr President, what we now have is a need to take real action on climate change, stop wasting taxpayers' money, stop rewarding the big polluters, the big donors in the fossil fuel area who are now laughing their heads off as they got massive windfall gains and now want more out of the taxpayers. We need genuine action on global warming. And that's why the Greens stand here today saying that's exactly what we will continue to campaign for, to keep the renewable energy target at 41,000 gigawatt hours out to 2020 and go for 100 per cent as fast as we can get there, to shut down some coal-fired generators to actually get this country moving. And so uh, with that, uh, Mr President, I move the uh, second reading uh, um, amendment uh, that I have uh, just foreshadowed.